Welcome to the next video in the Life on Earth topic. This video is going to be looking at two dot points, discuss the implications of the existence of organic molecules in the cosmos for the origin of life on Earth, and describe, describe sorry, two scientific theories relating to the evolution of the chemicals of life and discuss their significance in understanding the origin of life. So before we go on, let's have a little bit of an introduction. So there is very little evidence towards the existence of molecules in the universe or cosmos. However, there are several scientific theories to explain their existence or creation and how this led to life on Earth. So there are a number of theories that exist to account for the origin of life on Earth. And some of these include the idea of spontaneous generation, biochemical evolution, which can also sometimes be known as chemosynthesis, undersea thermal vents and panspermia. So these obviously aren't all the theories that exist to try to explain how life on Earth began, but these are the four we're going to look at, and you really only need to look at two of them in particular in detail. So firstly, let's have a look at spontaneous generation. So spontaneous generation was put forward by Aristotle, and he suggested that life was able to arise spontaneously. So life was able to come from nothing. Assuming that certain particles of matter contained an active principle which could pro produce a living organism when conditions were suitable. Now, this was believed for quite some time until a scientist called Reddy came along and disproved Aristotle's theory. So what he did was he set up three jars just like the one in the picture at the top where he placed a small piece of meat. He left one jar open, placed a cork in another jar and covered a third jar with some gauze. And what he found was that the jars that had lids on them that stopped the flies from getting to the meat didn't grow any maggots. Okay, so only the jar that was left open where the flies could actually lay their eggs on the meat had the maggots grow on the meat. So he was able to show that the maggots did not just spontaneously generate from nothing, that they had there had to be another organism present in order for those maggots to form. Another example of a theory is the biochemical evolution theory, or which is also sometimes referred to as chemosynthesis. So just like photosynthesis, the making of something using chemicals. So this theory suggests that certain conditions of early earth generated the organic compounds and the right environment for the first production of a living organism. So we've already looked at the particular uh, elements and the conditions that were present on early earth. So what is believed was that these uh, elements and the conditions were able to create new compounds that then gave rise to the first living organisms. So this theory was put forward by two men known as Oparin and Haldane, who suggested that organic compounds could have formed from simple compounds and the energy required from these reactions would have been supplied by the sun and by the lightning strikes that we discussed in the previous video. Oparin argued that the amount of simple molecules present, the energy available and the time scale, uh, it was conceivable that the oceans could have produced the primordial soup in which life could have arisen. So basically what they mean by primordial soup is once the conditions on Earth changed and it started to cool down, we still had the, the warm the warm water that was constantly moving, the electrical uh, charges from the lightning strikes, the ocean's waters that were sort of quite shallow formed this dark soupy uh, substance which they called the primordial soup. So this theory has been widely accepted. However, major problems remain in explaining the transition from organic molecules to the more complex living organisms that we see now. But this is probably the most plausible explanation of what happened at the moment. Another theory is that life began in undersea thermal vents. So deep sea thermal vents release a range of chemicals including hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen cyanide and ammonia. And these chemicals are similar to those that were present in the atmosphere of early earth. Along with the chemicals, the water down in our deep sea thermal vents is quite hot because the water is being heated by the core because obviously it's quite it's deep under the ocean so it's uh, further away from the surface it's closer to the crust and it is turbulent so it's constantly moving bubbling which provides the energy for the chemical reactions 
Deep sea thermal vents or undersea thermal vents also release a range of metals, which may have acted as catalysts for the formation of the organic compounds necessary to form life on Earth. The last theory that we're going to look at is one known as panspermia. So this theory suggests that life could have arisen once or several times at various times and in various parts of the universe. So materials have been found in meteorites and comets that have revealed the presence of organic molecules, which may have acted as seeds falling onto the early earth. So what they've found is a number of different meteorites which contain those chemicals that we've discussed, those organic molecules uh, in varying quantities. And obviously those meteorites have come from somewhere else in the universe. So they believe that that's one way that these elements could have arrived on Earth. And at the moment, there is as yet no compelling evidence to either support or contradict this theory. So until there is consequent, oh, sorry, uh, evidence that can um, definitely prove that this isn't a theory, we still have a look at it until science obviously discovers a little bit more about it. So what are some implications of these theories? So for life to have originated, the following events needed to have happened. The required chemicals needed to be formed. These chemicals need to have come together in a way that um, could create a self-replicating body. This body would need to have a form of protection for its contents and it had to be able to use an energy source to replicate itself. So as we can see, uh, requirement of energy producing or self-replicating, so producing more of the same uh, requiring an energy source. Okay, so we're starting to get into those ideas that we looked at earlier in the requirements of life. And we're starting to see that these chemicals needed to be able to have done these things in order for the theories to be accepted. The first step needed for life to be formed would be that the organic molecules needed for life would have to be present in some way, whether they came from out of space, whether they formed uh, in the oceans and these organic molecules could have been formed here on earth or sent to earth from out of space or the cosmos as I just said and that brings us to the end of this video and thank you for watching